All right, awesome. So, um, hi everyone, my name is Henry and I'm the president of the Saratoga Economics Club. First, I wanted to thank you all for coming to our event. We're all super excited to have you here. Um, I'm just gonna briefly start with a few norms for our presentations. So first, um, please turn on your cameras if possible to show respect for our speakers. Second, if you have any questions during the Q&A portions of the event, please Zoom private message them to Aparva Chakravarti. Please know that you note that you don't need to wait until the end of the talk to message them to Aparva. All right, without further ado, we'll briefly introduce the other officers and then we'll get right into the event. Hi, I'm Cheryl, I'm a junior and I'm the executive VP of Toby Econ Club. Uh, hey guys, I'm Andy Chen. I am also a junior and I'm the other executive VP of the Econ Club. Hi everyone, I'm Apoorva. I'm also a junior and I'm the VP of finance and I'm also the person that you should message your questions to. Hi everyone, I'm Marcus Kuo and I'm a junior and I'm the vice president of operations. Hey everyone, my name is Nilay Mishra. I'm a sophomore and I'm the Vice President of Outreach. Okay, so let's get started. Our first speaker will be Professor Milgram. Professor Paul R. Milgram from Stanford University is one of the pioneers of modern auction theory. He was recently named a Distinguished Fellow of the American Economic Association and he's one of the world's leading auction designers. Please welcome Professor Milgram. Hello, how long did you want me to chat for? Like 10 or 15 minutes was what I think you had in mind, right? Something yeah, like that. That would be perfect. Yeah, that would be perfect. Okay, so um, I wasn't quite sure what background everybody had. So if you'll give me a moment, um, let's see if I can, um, I was just going to talk about a simple, can you guys see my screen? It says truthful auctions, right? Yep. Okay, good. So I'm just going to give you um, a, a little bit about uh, truthful auctions and some of the things that are going on uh, without getting too advanced. Um, and, uh, and for those of you who haven't studied auctions before, the, you know, many of you, when you think of bidding, think of a sealed bid what economists call a first price auction, in which um, you're bidding for something and each person privately writes down a number on a piece of paper and you collect the numbers and the bidder who names the highest number wins. And if there's a tie, they're broken at random. And the, the winning bidder then uh, pays the amount of their bid. So that's the kind of auction most people are familiar with. Now, um, there's also something called a second price auction and it starts the same way. Each bidder writes down a number privately on a piece of paper and the highest bidder um, wins. But the price, instead of being set equal to the uh, bid that you've made, is set equal to the highest losing bid. So if I bid uh, uh, 10 is my winning bid and Marcus bids eight and that's the second highest bid, then I win uh, my bid of 10 wins and I pay a price of eight. Now, uh, what's interesting about this auction is that um, it's a, a rational bidder in this auction should bid the highest price that he's willing to pay. So if, if, you have, if this thing is worth 10 to me, um, then I, I did a good job by bidding 10 because if the second highest bid is below 10, uh, then I'm gonna win and, and win it for a, price, um, uh, for, for a price I'm willing to pay. And if, if anybody has bid more than 10, well, then I'm gonna lose and I'm happy to lose because the only way I could have won was by paying a price that was more than I was willing to pay. So the um, a bidder who bids exactly the price he's willing to pay um, will find that that's his optimal bid. And this is what we mean by an auction being truthful. Now, um, in, a, in a general auction model, and I'll talk a little bit about these, I don't wanna go into too much detail, but imagine that there's just one item for sale and you've got some number N of bidders and um, the item is worth a value VN to bidder number N. So um, that means that the bidder N would prefer to buy if the price is no more than VN and would prefer not to buy if the price is higher than VN. And of course, a winning bidder always prefers to pay the lowest possible price. I'd like to win uh, at the lowest price I can. So um, I, I'm going to teach you just a little bit of game theory. This will be the only really mathy slide in here, but 
I wasn't sure what your math background would be. But um, we, we analyze auctions using game theory. And um, a game in what's called strategic form is just a triple, it consists of three things, a, an N, an S, and a Pi, where N is the set of players. So maybe uh, Marcus, Nile, and Aperva are the players in this game. And uh, each player has a set of strategies, which are things that they're allowed to do in the game. That's SN. And S is just the product of those things. So S says, um, what's the strategy that's played by Marcus, what by Nile, and what by Aperva? And, and the third thing that we need to specify the game is, is a mapping, a payoff function that maps strategy profiles into payoffs. So depending on what Marcus and Nile and Aperva do, something happens and they earn some payoffs. And uh, we, we use this method to model auctions and certain other games as well. Um, in a game, a strategy is said to be dominant for a player if it maximizes your payoff regardless of what the others may play and if no other strategy has the same property. So in the second price auction that I described to you, bidding truthfully was a dominant strategy because no matter what everybody else did, uh, if I bid 10 in that auction, I get the best possible payoff for myself. If the highest opposing bid was less than 10, I'd win and I'd be happy with that. If the highest opposing bid was greater than 10, I'd lose and I'd be happy with that too. So that would be an example of a dominant strategy. And um, this is what it is formally for those of you who are mathematically inclined. In a game, a strategy is dominant if no matter what strategies everybody else plays, the strategy S bar N is one of the arguments that maximizes the payoff for uh, player N. So that's what it means to be a dominant strategy. Now, um, we're gonna say that an auction is truthful if each player's dominant strategy is to bid truthfully, that is to report their value. Uh, that's what we mean by a truthful strategy. And uh, the second price auction, as I've already argued for you, is a truthful auction. And in fact, um, I'm not gonna go over the proof, but the, um, it's the only auction with this property. The second price auction is the only auction for this setting with the three properties that it's truthful, that the outcome is always efficient, the bidder with the highest value always wins, and that losers pay zero. And uh, we can prove that mathematically. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to show you some other things we can do with truthful auctions. One other thing, it's a short talk I'm giving you. So I'll show you one other thing we can do with truthful auctions. And I'm going to skip this stuff here. And I'm going to tell you about an airline overbooking problem. So um, this is a problem that's very closely related to the spectrum auction design I did for the United States government. But it's a simpler version and one that I think you can all follow. So imagine that we've got um, an aircraft here. And you can see it's got a first class and a business class and an economy class. And uh, initially, there's plenty of seats for everyone on the plane. But unfortunately, there's mechanical trouble. And um, there's a mechanical problem. They have to substitute a smaller plane. And all of a sudden, there's not room for everybody on the plane. We can't fit everybody in first class or in business class or in coach that was on there before. And what the airline would like to do is offer them some money um, to uh, take a later flight and uh, to give up their seats on, on this flight. And so it, it decides it's gonna run an auction. And I wanna show you a way that the airline can run an auction to make this truthful for all of the participants and to get an efficient outcome. And that's basically the last thing I'll do with the time that I have available. So the airline's gonna do this. The airline's gonna say, you know what? I'm gonna start by offering a high amount of money tentatively. Uh, I'm gonna offer $1,000 and see if anybody for $1,000 would be willing to give up their seats. And guess what? A lot of people say, well, $1,000 is a lot of money. There's another flight in two hours. Yeah, I'll give up my seat. And so you got all these people that exit um, say, you know what? I give up my seat for $1,000. And the airline says, oh, you know, that's too high. I guess um, I didn't need to offer that much. Now I've got empty seats on the plane. Well, that was only a tentative offer. Let me suppose that I reduce the offer to $800 what will happen? Well, some of these guys will change their mind and go shooting back. And you can now see that first class is full. In this case, business class and economy class are not full, but first class is full. And uh, the airline says, fine, I, I, can't, I need these guys now to give up their seats in order to 
uh, give seats to these guys. So I'm going to freeze the price of $800 for these guys. Those guys I'll pay $800, but I don't have to offer $800 to all these guys because I still have empty seats in business class and economy class. So I'm going to lower the compensation again. Let's try $600. Some of those guys go shooting back, but I still have empty seats and business class and economy class. So I drop it again to $500. Oops, well, at $500, it looks like business class is now full. And there's still seats in economy, but I need to buy these two guys uh, rights because there's no, there's no place to set them anymore. So I'm gonna pay those two guys $500. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue to lower the price 400 some guys go back 300 still got empty seats in the economy 250 oops economy is full at 250 so I'm going to buy the seats of these seven guys for uh, offer them $250. This is what's called a descending clock auction um, There's an auction where the prices are going down and um, and it's an interesting auction for several reasons. First of all, it's adaptable to some really complex problems. We ran an auction that's similar to this to buy television broadcast rights from uh, TV broadcasters a few years ago. It was a um, uh, $10 billion auction. We were buying, the, they gave up the rights in order for us to have spectrum that we could use for mobile broadband. So it's adaptable. Second, each bidder has a dominant strategy. If you were participating back in this auction, and this thing was worth $400 to your seat. You know, the best you could do is to say yes to any offer over $400 and no to any offer under $400. There's nothing else that you could do. So this auction too is a truthful auction. It has a dominant strategy, which is to bid, uh, to say yes to offers over your value and no to offers under your value. And um, it, it leads to an efficient outcome in this particular case it's privacy preserving. That means you never get to find out um, for the winners of the auction, you never get to find out what prices um, they would have been willing. The guys who end up going on the, uh, um, going on the airplane, uh, you know, or, or going off the airplane, you never get to find out what price they would have been willing to accept. And I'm, not, I'm gonna skip the group strategy proof and uh, just leave it at that because I think I'm already up against my time. But the point, the point I'm trying to make for you is that uh, we can sometimes design auctions that in, in very complex settings that make it easy for bidders, that make it in their interest to bid truthfully, and that lead to pretty good outcomes. And that's my uh, uh, short presentation about auction theory. Thank you so much, Professor Milgram. This was incredibly interesting. Mm -hmm. We just have a few questions for you if you have some time to answer them. Sure. So our first is when would an auction holder host a second price auction over a first price auction? Well, it really depends on what your objectives are uh, when you run the auction. In the, in the case of government auctions, like the one that um, um, I'm describing the, 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 uh, the auction for radio spectrum. The government really wanted an efficient outcome. It wanted something that was predictable, that was easy for bidders so that they would participate. It wanted the um, outcome to be efficient. And a second price auction does all of those things. So if those are your goals, then a second price auction is a good idea. Now, I didn't go over with you um, what to expect the average price to be. And there's some famous results in auction theory that tell us that if you're selling something and using the second price auction under the assumptions of, the, of these models, you don't end up with any lower price either. You get the same price on average, um, but you get something that's more predictable and more likely to be efficient. So actually there's a lot of situations in which um, uh, you might tend to use a second price type auction. Okay, and then kind of speaking along your government work, could you go into a little bit like more in depth into what the actual project was and what they wanted the outcome to be? Ooh, okay, well, I had specifically left that off, but I could do that. It's in here in my hidden slides. Um, um, what am I gonna tell you about, the, about this? Okay, um, so what I did was the uh, something called the incentive auction. And you know what? 
if I don't know that I can play a video and have it show well over Zoom. It probably won't work, huh? Can I play a video over Zoom, do you think? I think I think it could work. I think the internet might cut out though, but you can try. I'll try this. This will show you what it was about, okay? The electromagnetic spectrum, or just spectrum, is the huge range of wireless frequencies used for all sorts of different things, from x-rays to microwaves, garage door openers and baby monitors to broadcast television. Everything wireless uses spectrum. There's a certain part of spectrum that is particularly useful for various technologies. This spectrum is licensed by the government to different users so that the signals don't interfere with each other. Companies that run satellites radio, mobile phones, and broadcast television all license different parts of spectrum. But what we want to really focus on is spectrum that's part of the broadcast spectrum incentive auction. The process for this auction begins in late 2015 and will involve the FCC buying some of the licensed spectrum from broadcast television and then selling it to wireless broadband companies. Five years ago, the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, proposed the idea for an auction in the National Broadband Plan. Congress authorized the FCC to proceed a couple of years later. And for the last few years, the FCC has been sketching out the detailed and involved rules for this first ever incentive auction. There are three interrelated components to this process. There's a reverse auction, where broadcasters will voluntarily decide whether or not to sell their spectrum rights to the FCC. Broadcasters will bid downward against each other to give up their spectrum. At the same time, wireless broadband providers will bid upward in a forward auction to buy that spectrum. Finally, there's repacking, a mandatory nationwide process where all broadcasters that stay on the air may be required to move to new channels. The FCC will begin the auction process later this year, with station applications to participate due by December 18th. The actual auction will start on March 29th, 2016, and will take somewhere between a few weeks and a few months. After the auction is completed, likely in the early summer of 2016, the FCC will announce the results and everyone's new channel assignments. Why is this happening? It's to really address wireless industry demand for Spectrum, to increase broadband availability in the country, and to generate revenue for a number of government initiatives. Because the difference between what is paid in a forward auction and what is paid out in the reverse will be kept by the government for these purposes. Who will it affect? In terms of the voluntary auction, nearly every station will get an opening offer to sell, but ultimately, the FCC is expected to buy spectrum in large markets, geographically adjacent markets, or congested markets where there are a lot of broadcasters. As for the repacking, that will be a mandatory nationwide process that could affect any station on any channel in any market. So that was the context. Um, we were uh, buying uh, television broadcast rights and selling mobile broadband rights. We sold $20 billion of mobile broadband rights and bought about $10 billion worth of uh, television broadcast rights and repacked the stations. It was a very complicated process, but a big chunk of it, the, the bidding downward, looked a lot like what I just showed you for uh, uh, buying buying seats, uh, we, were, we were buying television broadcast rights. I showed you roughly how you do that by buying uh, seats from people who were entitled to, uh, to fly on an airplane. Wow, that's really cool. Thank you so much, Professor Milgram. This was extremely exciting. I think that's all of the time we have for today though. Okay. Thank you again so much for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll be moving on to our next speaker now. Professor Leia Arif is the Uwe E. Reinhardt Professor of Economics at Princeton University. She founded and currently directs the Princeton Experimental Laboratory for the Social Sciences. Professor Arif has participated on several editorial boards and is a research fellow of the CEPR and the NBER. Please welcome Pro Pro Professor Arif.
think I'm muted. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I'm going to tell you about experimental economics. And experimental economics uh, uses controlled scientific experiments to test what choices people make in various uh, circumstances. And it's useful for a variety of applications. So uh, consumer behavior, how people choose different products in the market, how to conduct auctions, like the ones that Paul Mulgram was just telling you about, how to run elections or juries, how to match people to jobs, how to organize financial markets, strategic interactions in general, and so on and so forth. In fact, it's hard to think about a topic in economics that has been left untouched by experiments. So what's an experimental lab? This is an experimental lab. So this is our new experimental lab at Princeton, the Princeton Experimental Laboratory for the Social Sciences. So you see a bunch of very happy participants in the first experiments that we ran there. Uh, and it's, it's basically a computer lab. So most of our experiments happen uh, via games that are played on computers. And I'll soon, soon show you some examples of what it looks like. Now, why do we want to use experiments? So think about going on a plane and being told that the physicists and aerodynamics professionals all looked at the blueprints and said it was fine, but it's never been tested before. You'd probably not feel terribly comfortable going on a flight. Or imagine going to a doctor and being recommended a new drug or a vaccine and being told that the biologist uh, said it's a-okay, but that it's never been tried before. You wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Uh, so why should we treat new policies or new market design ideas like auctions or election formats or matching platforms any differently? So this is kind of our um, us economists think very much like, like the physicists or the biologists who run experiments to make sure that the theories uh, are, are confirmed with data. Now, it's often complemented by field data. So often we have a lot of data around us about economic phenomena. So it's a, the, the two are extremely useful and complementary to one another. But I'll show you some cases where experiments might be particularly useful. Now, I should say that uh, I, I was not, uh, unlike you guys who are all interested in economics, I would, did not actually start from economics, definitely not from experiments. I started as a math nerd. I stumbled on economics when I was actually doing grad school in math and I, I was thinking of switching to medicine and then I took a bunch of classes in economics and was told to apply to the US. and. And, and here I am. I also stumbled on experiments and I'll tell you how that happened. So, and, and what follows, I'll try to give you a glimpse into some of the stuff that I do and I'll focus on two topics that I've been interested in. One has to do with communication and voting and the other has to do with social networks. So on communication, uh, I started this project when I was very young uh, together with my friend Dino Girardi. Uh, and our starting point was the observation that most group decisions are preceded by communication. So you can think about any important decision that you've made in your life and think whether you, you consulted with anyone, maybe your parents, maybe your siblings, maybe your friends or your, your advisors in school or what have you. It's very hard to think of situations where we make really important decisions and we make them in isolation. Now, in conjunction to this, when we look at how people make decisions in groups, there is a huge variety of voting rules. I'm really into uh, uh, law TV, legal TV series, and I, I used to watch them as a kid in Israel. And I always thought that juries always use unanimity, but in fact, that's not the case. So for instance, even when you look at the narrow type of decision-making like civil courts in the US, there's a wide variety of voting rules that, that they use. So we were wondering whether communication actually um, impacts outcomes, and maybe it is at the heart of explaining why we see these wide array of, of voting rules. And, and what we noticed using mathematical models was that communication actually allows groups to decide what they want and then basically circumvent the voting rule. So they can just vote in consensus. So the voting rule basically doesn't matter. You just decide as a group what you want to do. And then you, you vote in the way that makes that thing happen. 
So the voting rule stops mattering if communication is actually available. Now, I should say that the original reaction to this paper was not positive. So when we wrote it, we were very young and we got rejected everywhere. It was heartbreaking. Um, this is one story of perseverance, just as kind of a personal advice on how it's important to, to not just give up when you face difficulty, because 18 years later, it's one of my most cited papers with many follow-ups. Now, I really wanted to test this model. I really wanted to see how communication affects, affects decisions, but it's really hard to do with data. Uh, because communication is, is never really documented. Even when you look at juries where the deliberation is really very well circumscribed and we have the deliberation room and a lot is documented, it's very hard to actually get access to the precise protocols of communication. So I realized very quickly that experiments might be really, really useful here. And I, I, I was very young, so I, I wanted to get a pro on my team because I thought I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I needed, I needed someone to help me navigate my first experiment. And it took me a bunch of trials, but I finally did find a pro to actually help me run this experiment. And, and we looked at groups of nine participants and gave them information about an outcome and then allowed them to talk or, or not. And we looked at various voting rules because ultimately we wanted to see how the voting rules matter for outcomes. So we looked at simple majority and two thirds super majority and unanimity, like we see in legal TV series. So let me show you what it looked like. Uh, so here is an example of an experimental interface. Now you don't need to read all the text on the left here, but the main idea is the following. So we had two jars. So you can think about the jar, the, the jars as if the, a defendant and a jury is in a trial is either guilty or innocent. So for us, guilty was a red jar that had seven red balls and three blue balls. And innocent was a blue jar that had seven blue balls and, and only three red, red balls. Now, we didn't tell participants which jar we would select. What they saw is just the jar selected with all the balls covered. Now they could click on one of the balls to see the color. So this is just like getting a testimony in a trial. So you get some information, but it's not the full picture. So for example, if you clicked on one of the balls and you saw that it's a red ball, um, if you were uh, doing things properly statistically, you would deduce that it's more likely to be a red jar. Now, when they co couldn't communicate, they would just have to guess which jar it was, jar one or jar two. And then depending on what everyone in the group chose, uh, we would arrive at the group decision. So this is just like a decision to convict or acquit. And if you have enough votes to convict, that's the guess of the group. Otherwise, it's acquittal or a, a guess of a blue jar. When we allowed them to communicate, that they actually had a pop-out screen that showed up that was just like a texting opportunity for them. So they could communicate freely with uh, people in their group. They could even choose to communicate with a subgroup if they wanted. They basically never wanted to do that. And, and they could communicate freely until they were ready to finish communication, at which point they, they could decide whether to, to, to guess that the jar was red or blue, quit or convict. And then they were taught, shown everything. Now, usually in experiments, we get people to run through this game many times because it's, it's sometimes confusing in the beginning when we wanna make sure that they learn the interface, they learn kind of how other people play, they kind of get a hang of the game. Now, what did we see? So what I'm showing you here are the main results. So these are the probabilities of conviction or a probability that the group guesses red as a function of the number of red signals in the group. So remember that each person kind of clicks on the ball and it's either red or blue. So ultimately you can just count how many of the nine people in the group saw a red ball. This is this number over here. Now, if you're a perfect statistician and you observed all of these signals, if there are enough red signals, you would guess that the jar is red. And if there are enough blue signals or very few red signals, you would guess that the jar is blue. 
So in fact, if you were a perfect statistician and you could observe all of the signals, what you would do is, is, is choose red with 100% if five or more signals were red and otherwise choose red with 0% or in other words, guess blue uh, when four or less signals were red. Now, what you see here are the percentages that corresponds to simple majority, two-thirds supermajority, and unanimity. So, uh, for example, in unanimity, all of the group members had to choose red in order for red to be selected. That basically never happened. You see here zero percent throughout. So, what do you get? What do you see here? First of all, um, we see that they're very far from what a statistician would do, unless they're doing simple majority. And second of all, the voting rules have a lot of impact. And that's what the literature thought they, they, it, it would do. So we thought till, till we introduced communication that the voting rule would really, really matter. And it does here. Now, this is what happens when we allow them to communicate with one another. So uh, first of all, they choose uh, almost like a perfect statistician. And second of all, the voting rule almost doesn't matter. So this was really, really exciting. And, and the paper had a lot of analysis and details, but when, when we created this table, I was hooked. Um, and that actually led to many studies that, that followed. So uh, I, I'm still working on communication and voting, but over time, I also wanted to study uh, more intricate interactions between individuals. And social networks are one such uh, 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 environment where the social network itself affects who you talk with. So I did a bunch of studies that were more mathematical in nature, where we studied diffusion, disease of disease, of knowledge, of products on social networks. And, and I did a bunch of empirical uh, studies, uh, one of which I'll tell you about in a minute. So, so let me get right to it. So what you're seeing here is, is a figure of the social network of fifth and sixth graders from Westridge, which is not too far from your guys. It's at least in the same states. It's in, it's in Pasadena. Uh, and, and it's an all girls school. And this study was actually done. One of the co authors here is a was a student at the school. She was 12 years old when we wrote this paper. And what you see here is each dot representing a girl. Uh, the color represents ethnicity. The size of the circle here corresponds to how many friends she has. So people who are more popular correspond to a larger circle. So when I was their age, I was like one of these tiny dots. And, and the thick lines correspond to people who name one another as a friend, whereas thinner lines mean that one person named the other as a friend, but not vice versa. And that's actually quite common in these studies. Now, we elicited these networks, and I'll tell you something about them in a minute, uh, but a few months later, we actually came back to the school and ran some experiments using the information from the network. And we ran one of the oldest and simplest experiments known to men, and it's called the dictator game. So in the dictator game, you get a certain amount of money, uh, say in this case, $6, and you have to split it between you and a random person. Now, economists are very cold hearted. We think, why would anyone give anyone else money if they don't have to? Uh, so it was a real shock that many experiments actually illustrate that people give a substantial amount of money. Um, now, what we did here is use the social networks. And when these girls were allocating uh, an amount of money to a friend, we varied how close that friend was to them. So whether they were a direct friend or a friend of a friend or a friend of a friend of a friend, et cetera. And they gave more to their direct friends, more, uh, a bit less to the friends of friends, uh, less to friends of friends of friends and so on and so forth. In fact, if you, if you call the, you use the distance to capture the closeness of the friend, so distance of one to a direct friend and distance of two to a friend of a friend and so on, what we saw is that given behave kind of like a one over D function. 
Now, this could have a lot of implications if you think about uh, giving favors to people who are close to you socially. So you can imagine that this has many implications that, that one could study following this. But it also raised the question of, of how this network gets formed to begin with if it really affects behavior. And what we saw was a strong evidence for homophily. So homophily, it sounds like a disease. Uh, it's, it's actually a term that sociologists uh, uh, introduced and it literally means love for the same. And it captures this tendency of people to connect to those who are similar to them. And so you can think about your own friends and whether they're similar to you in some regards, for example, their, their uh, attitudes to other people, their, their families, their ethnicity, and so on and so forth. And we saw homophily over both what we call non-malleable traits like race and height. These are things that you can't change, as well as malleable traits like confidence or popularity, where you think maybe the friendship itself might actually affect the, the people who are involved. So this led to a bunch of other questions and I won't go into details, but I started studying general games that are played on networks. I also studied a lot of, of uh, um, about how these homophil homophilous connections evolve and when we might actually see polarization in groups and so on and so forth. Now, as a follow up before I finish, we, we actually ran a much more elaborate version of this study more recently at Caltech. So I was a neighbor of you guys uh, till a few years ago. I was at Caltech before I moved to Princeton. And Caltech is a very small school. It has fewer than a thousand kids. So we could reliably survey all of, nearly all of them repeatedly. And this is what we did. So we actually approached these students and we elicited from them a bunch of things, both behaviors, their social network, their study partners, their attitudes toward gender and race, their lifestyle choices, and so on and so forth. And, and we saw a lot of very strong evidence for ethnic homophily and gender homophily. So what you see here is the likelihood of of befriending someone who's of the same ethnicity as opposed to a different ethnicity. You see that it's very, the difference is very pronounced, especially for new friendships when they're freshmen. The, we see the same sort of thing when we look at gender. If anything here, actually for sophomores, it's a bit more pronounced and then it declines. Uh, but we see a very strong tendency to connect to people of the same gender. And this tends to have an effect on outcomes. So here I'm just choose one like gain in GPA. Uh, and when study partners are both females, they tend to gain more in GPA uh, than mixed genders or all male gender uh, study partners, which is kind of curious. And I see a lot of guys here, so I'm sorry. All right, some unsolicited advice uh, before I finish. I hope you, whatever you do, you make sure it's fun and interesting. Um, academic success, as I hope I, I kind of hinted at, is a lot about perseverance, passion, hard work, and a little bit of risk taking. Um, I hope you take the next step that you're not ready for. I definitely took that and still taking that each and every day. Um, and get inspiration from what's around you. So most of what I worked on just started from me ob observing stuff around me and, and being curious about what made it happen. I hope you bloom where you're planted wherever you go and find time to breathe, especially with all the fires and the viruses, etc. And that's all I have to tell you today. Thank you so much, Professor Yar. This is so interesting and your advice is very useful. I think we'll have time for one question. So you're wondering, so how would your voting experiment relate to like large scale elections like the presidential election in November? Like what could candidates do to increase popularity among groups? Oh, okay, that's a loaded question. So I, I have to say that our models are very good for small groups. For large groups, they're hard to capture, right? Because if you think about these sorts of communication, of course there are polls and there are 
there are newspapers and media that are a way for us to communicate with one another, but, but they're not quite the direct, they're not like texting with, within all the citizens of the US, right? So maybe you follow Twitter and you see some stuff, but even there you don't see everything, right? So I'm not sure this could be directly extended to elections, but actually polls and uh, these sorts of channels are, are things that I've found very interesting and we have some experiments on them as well. Uh, and you can think how, how politicians might be strategic with how they run the polls and how they report the polls. So yeah, it's, yeah. it's an exciting area. Yeah, definitely. And also someone was also wondering, um, is your voting paper published and where could they find it? Um, it's all on my webpage. So you, the theoretical stuff is called Deliberative Voting. It was published in the Journal of Economic Theory. And the experiments, uh, I don't remember precisely the title. It was published around 2011. It's in Econometrica. Uh, so you can find it on my website. OK. OK, thank you so much, Professor. Thank no problem. My pleasure. <laughs> now, um, Professor. Uh, George Malice. Hello. He, he contributed greatly to the non cooperative game theory, evolutionary game theory, and pricing. Um, he's currently the Walter H. Annenberg Professor in Social Studies and Professor of Economics at the University of Pennsylvania and a professor at the Australian National University. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Malice. Thank you. Okay, let me just, uh, I had a brief problem with the, uh, my computer a second ago, so I'm hoping that this was all set aside. Okay, so I hope you can all see my screen. Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me to talk, and uh, I thought I would talk today about reputations. So what does it mean to say that you have a good reputation or that a firm has a good reputation. If you're a customer and you eat in a good restaurant, you expect a nice meal. If you buy from a good online retailer, you expect to receive what you ordered in good condition. A firm hires a good worker expecting the worker to provide an honest day's work. A worker hired by a good firm expects to be paid for an honest day's work. So that's intuitively what we think a good reputation is about. So why do economists study reputations? Why did I spend a lot of my life studying reputations? Reputations are important because they provide incentives for good behavior. They provide incentives for the restaurant to provide you with a good meal, for the online retailer to properly package the good and send it reputed by a reputable uh, company for the worker to uh, work hard at the firm, for the firm to treat the worker well. Examples where we see firms caring about their reputation are firms uh, using the uh, review mechanism at Yelp, Amazon, and eBay to enable customers to leave reviews of their sellers so that the uh, sellers can benefit from their reputation. So that's what I'd like to explore in, a, in uh, my short chat today. And I'd like to do that through a little parable. And our little parable is going to concern a, sh a chef who is interacting with some customers. And what I've drawn down here is, you've already had a brief introduction from Professor Milgram about game theory. So this is a simple strategic form game where the chef is choosing effort or shirking in the provision of uh, the meal. And the customer walks into the uh, cafe and decides whether to have a steak or to have a hamburger for the meal. And you'll see that in this little box, I've got two uh, numbers written down. The number two, for example, this corresponds to the chef's payoffs from exerting effort and having the customer buy the steak. Three corresponds to the chef's payoff when he shirks and the customer uh, buys the steak. And not surprisingly, shirking is easier for the chef, so he has higher profits. He doesn't have to expend as much money on high quality produce. He doesn't have to get up early to get to the butcher to get the best uh, cut of meat and so on. The second number is the customer's satisfaction. So for example, three, this is the satisfaction that our customer gets from buying a steak 
and having the chef put in the high effort to really make a nice uh, juicy steak. One, on the other hand, is the payoff that our customer gets from having a hamburger and the chef having shirked in the uh, cooking of the hamburger. And so now the first thing I'd like to think about is uh, what those numbers mean. And you can see here that I've uh, indicated in red the effort stake outcome. So this is where the chef gets a profit of two and the customer gets a uh, satisfaction level of three. And this is their preferred outcome, right? That's an outcome where given that the chef is exerting effort, the customer really enjoys the steak, whereas the um, chef prefers that the customer is uh, buying the steak rather than eating the hamburger because he gets more money as a higher profit margin on the steak rather than uh, from the hamburger. But now let's suppose that this is a pop-up cafe. And by a pop-up cafe, I mean that the chef is sitting at home, he's bored, so he decides to see if he can just have a barbecue that afternoon and make some money by selling a steak or a hamburger to his neighbors. Now, what's going to happen in this pop-up cafe? Well, the customer, when they're talking to the chef and they're deciding between the steak and the hamburger, they don't know whether the chef is exerting high effort or low effort. Similarly, the chef, when he's deciding whether to buy the expensive cut of meat or the cheap cut of meat, he doesn't know whether the customer is going to order the steak or the hamburger. And as you can see from the numbers that I've written here, three is larger than two, one is bigger than zero. So there's always this incentive for the chef to shirk. He should buy the cheap cut of meat because he's going to make more money from uh, shirking. And because of that, we're going to get the result in blue. The chef is going to shirk and the customer is going to buy the hamburger. And as I said earlier on, this outcome is not such a good outcome for either the chef or the customer. They would both prefer for the chef to exert effort and for the customer to order the steak rather than having the chef shirking and the customer eating the hamburger. But because this is a pop-up cafe, we're stuck with that uh, shirk hamburger outcome. The shirking behavior by the chef results in a worse outcome for both the chef and the customer. But now I'd like to tell you a different story. Now let's suppose that the chef, rather than trying to run the business one afternoon in his backyard, decides to open a cafe and be in business for a long time. And let's suppose that the customers can post reviews how much they enjoyed the meal so that new customers can decide on the basis of the previous reviews whether they should order the steak or the hamburger. Well, now the future is going to have an impact. Now the chef, when he's making a decision between exerting effort or shirking, knows that what he does today is going to have an impact on what is going to happen tomorrow. In particular, the chef knows that his decision today, shirking or exerting effort, is going to generate either a positive or a negative review. And these positive or negative reviews will affect the behavior of the customers in the future. Firms care about the reviews that they get. And so now we get a completely different possibility. Now we have the possibility that the chef will put in effort if this results in future customers purchasing the steak rather than the hamburger. And why will future customers purchase the steak? Well, they've been seeing good reviews about the behavior of the chef before. And so they will perhaps expect that the chef will exert high effort and will exert effort in the future. And so they'd be willing to buy the steak. And so now what I've uh, told you is that the chef can have a reputation for exerting effort. And so we get this best outcome that we had talked about before. We get effort choice by the chef and we get the customers buying a steak in every period. And we have a uh, chef who's uh, happy with the operation of his cafe. But now let's explore that idea in a little more detail. So let's suppose we've got this cafe that's been in business for a long time and has had a bunch of good reviews. 
does this mean that the future of this cafe is necessarily rosy? That he's got a, uh, a, a nice nest egg to leave his children? And he may not. There may be a problem. If future customers expect the chef to stop putting in effort, maybe they think that the guy's been working hard for the last 10 years, he's looking a little peaked when they walk into the store and he's looking a bit tired. Maybe they're going to start thinking that he's no longer going to be putting it up. He's going to start shirking. And once they worry that he's going to start shirking, they're going to start buying the hamburger and the uh, future is no longer rosy. And so what this suggests is that there's this possibility that while the chef could have a reputation for exerting effort, the chef need not have this reputation. Indeed, the situation could be even worse. In many uh, cafes and restaurants, you don't actually see what the chef is doing in the kitchen. And you certainly don't see what kind of meat he had purchased from the butcher. Did he get there when the butcher first opened so he could buy the best cut of meat? Or did he just uh, pop in there a few minutes ago and buy uh, the stuff that's left over? And so that means we're in a situation where the customers are leaving reviews about whether they had a good meal or a bad meal, but they didn't observe the behavior of the chef. And so in this kind of situation, because cooking is kind of random, effort is not a guarantee that the customer gets a good meal. He may get a good meal, but he may not. Shirking also does not necessarily mean you'll get a bad meal. The chef could get lucky even though he shirked, the customer enjoyed the meal. Of course, exerting effort makes it more likely that the customers will be happy, but there are no guarantees in life. And so what does this mean? This means that even if the chef is putting in effort, the chef will get some bad reviews. And one bad review could be enough to destroy the chef's reputation. So, the bottom line from the story that I've been telling up till this point is that reputations may help to uh, provide incentives for the chef to exert effort. This reputation can be fragile and can be destroyed by bad luck. But what was missing from the story that I just told? It was a very stark parable. Well, let's think about this. The chef that I just described can put in effort but he's always tempted to cheat and to shirk. So I'm going to think of this chef as being an opportunistic chef. This is a chef who's always just looking out for himself and is only willing to put in effort if there's a reason to in terms of future uh, benefit for his business. But there may be other kinds of chefs. In particular, the chef that I'm interested in is a good chef. The good chef is a chef who is incapable of shirking when cooking. When I would describe this work in seminars, I would often describe the opportunistic chef as the Australian chef, since I am Australian. And I can assure you that not all Australian chefs necessarily uh, make a point of giving you a good meal. French restaurants, on the other hand, it's hard to have a bad meal at a French restaurant. So I'm kind of inclined to think that uh, the French restaurants are the good uh, uh, sh chefs who are incapable of shirking when cooking. And the critical thing for our story is that the customers don't know for sure whether the chef who's cooking for them is opportunistic or good. There's uncertainty. So the occasional bad review now is bad news. But as I was describing earlier on, even the good chef could be unlucky. There might be something that he just didn't realize was wrong with the meat when he was cooking it. So even if you've got a French chef, you may have a bad meal. And so that means there are some bad reviews, there are some good reviews, but they don't necessarily tell you if the chef is good or bad. But by exerting effort, you're more likely to generate customers re receiving a good meal and so leaving a good review. And so this means that the opportunistic chef, if he always puts in effort, will eventually be treated as if she's good. And so this means that she will have a good reputation for a long time. So this possibility 
that people don't know, the customers don't know whether they're facing the good chef or the opportunistic chef, allows the opportunistic chef to uh, create this good reputation. But this is not the end of the story. And this is where I spent a lot of my uh, time working on reputations. Because the critical thing here is that customers know that the occasional bad review is to be expected even from the good chef. But if the chef is opportunistic and the customers believe that she is the good chef, she then knows that she can cheat a little bit because the customers are ex understand that occasionally they'll be disappointed. And so the occasional bad meal generated by a little bit of shirking won't damage the reputation of the opportunistic chef that much. But if she continues to do this, eventually the customers who are smart they will see that over time, they seem to be getting a few more bad meals than they expected. The customers will learn that the opportunistic chef is indeed opportunistic. And so the conclusion from this is that the opportunistic chef's reputation must eventually disappear. So I told you a parable that was a very stark story indicating how reputations can help to provide incentives for the chef to uh, put in effort in providing a meal, and yet sometimes these reputations still are going to disappear. So what did we learn? We learned that reputations are fragile and can vanish. Why is this important? A key insight from the above is that in order to have good reputational incentives, there needs to be limitations on memory. So two examples are relevant here. I mentioned at the beginning of my little chat about eBay and Amazon using the reviews of customers to try to indicate who are the uh, good sellers. But what's a good seller in this context? A good seller is a seller who's an honor seller. And, the, and there are people out there who, for uh, moral reasons, will sell you what they promise to sell. You will pack it properly and uh, you'll receive it. But you as a customer on Amazon or eBay don't know if this is the uh, seller that you're dealing with. But in order for these reviews to maintain incentives on these opportunistic sellers, the review summaries need to be imperfect. If we think about credit markets, the analog of the reviews are the credit reports. The analog of the good chef is the honest borrower, the person who always pays off their credit card bills and so on. And we already have limitations on memory on credit reports, which limit histories to seven years for most negative items. So let me stop there and see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you so much, Professor. Um, so we have two questions. Um, the first one is, once you have a bad reputation, how hard is it to get back to a good reputation? And what would you do to get back to it? Um, it can be hard, but in this world, what will happen? So sometimes, even if you're a good guy, you could just be unlucky, and we've all been unlucky, and you end up with having a bad reputation. It just takes time. You continue to uh, put in effort because by putting in effort, you make it more likely that the uh, customers will see, ha have a good experience, and so then slowly your reputation will go up. And there have been studies, both empirical and uh, theoretical, that investigate these reputation cycles, where the reputations of firms go up and go down in response to the experiences of the customers. Okay. And we had another question. So if customers like often choose to buy from, rep from reputable sellers, then how can new sellers make a reputation or get customers? Well, um, so I'm not, I mean, so in general, the way these things work on, for example, on eBay and Amazon is that you list yourself as a customer. Then in the beginning, it's very hard. So in the beginning, if you're a new uh, seller, you won't have a reputation. And so then you might try to get your friends to participate. You might offer a very good deal. And if you offer a very good deal, then some people will be prepared to buy from you, even though you don't have a good, a, a reputation as yet. But that question actually is a great question because it leads into another issue which I didn't have a chance to talk about here. But one of the big problems on the seller reputation mechanisms on eBay and Amazon 
is what is the one thing that you would want to do if you're cheating your customers and you have a bad reputation? You close up shop and you reopen as a new seller because all the buyers can see is your name that you chose when you went onto the site. And so it's very difficult to track the behavior of bad actors who just repackage themselves and continue to behave badly. Okay. Oh, we have one more question for you, we might, but we're a little bit over if you're okay. No, no, that's fine. That, I, I, I'm happy to chat. Okay, great. Thank you. So one of our questions is, so in your restaurant example, would the chef potentially have an incentive to um, intentionally make his hamburgers poorly, but try harder on his steaks? Because since he gets more profit from steaks, the reputation of his steaks would increase. Ah, excellent. So I, I was very careful in the parable that I described. So I avoided issues like that. But you're exactly right. If we were to enrich the parable, and uh, to encompass features like that, we would have to worry about these sorts of trade-offs that the uh, chef would be engaging in. And okay. then you'd also need to worry about how much communication, because the question would be, if you're, writing re if you're reading reviews about the steak, do you care if you read a review about a bad hamburger? I can imagine people reacting in two ways. Well, at least it's concentrating on the steak, so I don't care if there was a bad review on the hamburger. Or it might be, well, if he can't do hamburgers well, how can I possibly trust him with my steak? And so, it, the, and that's the uh, wonderful thing about doing these parables when we study economics, is that it allows us to unpack these kinds of stories and to see what, what, how do we think the world really works? Okay, okay, that was it for our questions. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much for staying. Thank you, and thank Bye, you. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, if you guys have any more questions or want to contact us, um, feel free to either message our Instagram or message individual officers. Um, and besides that, you guys can feel free to go. Thank you. Thank you.